so uh, the focus of today, uh, as I know it is, is hybrid modeling. And um, the motivating sort of premise of this work, and it's work that's been um, based on uh, a lot of direct observation of models, is when we talked about in the course of this semester um, dynamic modeling, we predominantly focused on three different types of dynamic modeling. Agent-based, system dynamics, and discrete event. And each of them characterizes processes out there in the world, uh, but does so using different languages. And sometimes in computer science, the term we like to use when we have the option of selecting different ways of describing a situation, characterizing dynamics in a model or, or specifying a program, we, we talk, like to talk about metalinguistic abstraction, okay? And I'd like to unpack that uh, a little bit. So as computer scientists, much of what we do is, is we build abstraction. We build components within programs within computational systems that solve problems. And a defining feature of abstraction is that we, we do so in a way that has generality, that hides the, the unimportant details between situations, and, and it handles lots of different cases. So we'll create a higher level abstraction that will allow us to, to deal in one, in one way one uh, focused way with a broad variety of different problems that differ in their vagaries, that differ in their, um, in their specifics. So we may create, for example, a model which um, characterizes the spread of, of infection within a facility, and um, it does so in a way that allows us to change parameter values observe the consequences using that same model under a wide variety of different, uh, different assumptions. Or in a software program, we create a function which handles some computational task, maybe it's sorting a large group of numbers, regardless of the, the particulars of whether you pass it 10 numbers, 100 numbers, 1,000 numbers, 100,000 numbers. We use the same abstraction to do that sort. Um, often the ways in which we characterize um, a situation have a lot to do with how we solve it. So often we will, we will use data structures, we'll use a, a characterization of the, um, of the information that's being manipulated in a way that will allow us to solve it most efficiently. And those who have taken 360, for example, know that there are big differences in the efficiency associated with different data structures. In addition, when we build up a program and we build up a model, we're seeking to characterize the situation being depicted in a way that's modular, that can allow us to substitute out parts, substitute in new parts, that's fairly transparent to people who look at it, including ourselves, um, that's easily modified, et cetera. One of the best ways that we can achieve um, reuse of components, that we can achieve generality to build a, a certain feature for a wide variety of cases is by actually choosing our language. This is this, the linguistic part. So in some cases we build a function, in some cases we build a class, or in some cases we build a set of interacting classes and a software pattern, like the publish-subscribe pattern, or we build something in the, um, in the visitor pattern, or what have you, these software patterns. But in other cases, the abstractions we built, these sort of um, constructs which allow us to solve a variety of different variants of the same sort of thing, we, we, built, we addressed the most effectively by, by designing a new language or, or providing a, a language that solves a certain set of, of challenges. 
And much of what we've seen in this class from a computational perspective has been three different languages for describing processes in the world. System dynamics, which, which provides a language for characterizing feedback rich systems where accumulation and, and the feedback serve strong central interest. So feedback based systems of accumulation. Um, we have agent based modeling, which involves characterizing situations where you have individual entities, not a continuous thing like a reservoir with you know, lots and lots of water in it in a, in a sort of continuous quantity, but cases where we have individual agents, whether they're cars, people, specific animals, or what have you, and they're interacting with each other and interacting with the environment in evolving within themselves, but also interacting. That's agent-based modeling. Discrete event modeling provides an exquisite way of describing processes that involve a defined workflow that's resource limited and where entities flow through that workflow, defined entities, not merely continuous quantities of things, not just bulk raw materials or what have you, but defined entities flow through it. So we have ABM, DES, and SD are each, from a computer science standpoint, associated with languages, the languages of stocks and flows, the languages associated with those workflows we use to characterize discrete event simulation systems, the languages associated with describing an ABM, state charts, events, the connections that, that mediate the connection between agents, et cetera. So really, much of what we see in the semester are three different languages for describing processes out there in the world. And these languages each have spheres of natural application. We can do things with each of these languages which will, which could allow us to characterize systems described by the other. But each language has an area of sort of core strategic advantage where it's just really elegant to describe things. Describing feedbacks in an accumulation rich system is something we could do with an ABM, but it will be awkward and tedious compared to using a system dynamics model with it. We could do it, but it wouldn't be the right tool for the job. It'd be a bit like using a hammer to drive in a spring. We could simply use an ABM to characterize a DES system, but it's not quite the right job. People will use sometimes DES to try to characterize what we would characterize with an ABM, but it's, it's awkward. It's awkward and it involves often a lot of additional mechanism. So from the standpoint of this semester and from, a, from the standpoint of a, of a computer scientist, a lot of what we're talking about here in the modeling space is language choice. What language do we use? What tool do we use to characterize this problem or that one? Um, and we choose between these, uh, between these different ways of describing we choose our language to solve the problem. And ladies and gentlemen, as computer scientists, um, we're in the fortunate position of not only being able to choose a language that's suitable for the job, but to be able to build new languages to describe new situations. And the languages which we see here have all really come about during my life um, and during yours, I think you'll see uh, additional languages as well that will allow you to characterize additional types of systems with crispness, with, uh, in a way that's clear, uh, in a way that um, captures the essentials and, and lets you ignore a lot of uh, vagaries of details that aren't essential to the issue. Um, so these languages are not static things, they're evolved. And as, as computer scientists, we can build languages that will allow us to describe the system in natural ways. And that's much of the power of computer science, is, is our ability to, 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 to choose our own languages, to formulate our own languages. And there's a whole area, for those who are not familiar with it, it's something we're gonna cover in 4, 470 next term, um, for at least one or two sessions. And that's the area of, of DSLs. Domain, 
specific languages. Okay, um, and so rather than describing all systems using the same um, the same basic uh, languages, you know, Java, PHP, Python, we actually build our own custom languages for certain types of tasks. And it turns out this is becoming easier and easier. So what I'm going to give you is kind of a summary as the current state of things um, uh, in terms of modeling languages. And the good news here is that these languages that we're talking about, ABM, DES, and FD, are not solitudes. They're not they're not a situation where we have to choose only one or the other. And indeed, that's much similar to the evolution of the, um, the platform stack associated with us as computer scientists. So w when I was a young person, um, I think it might be better to joke, but um, I'll hold off. When I was a young person, um, uh, you know, you would pick your language and stick within that environment. So typically, you would use Fortran for Fortran for a certain set of things, or C. And yes, we actually could could interact, but it was painful. It involved a lot of sort of shims and and uh, intermediate things that were that were really awkward. These days, it's gotten increasingly easy to mix and match languages. Not all. But there's a lot of languages that run on the JVM, for example, the Java Virtual Machine. So we have Scala, and we have Clojure, and we have Java, and we have, um, I think F Sharp, no, F Sharp runs on the .NET, and .NET has its own things with C Sharp, and ASP.NET, and others, which can basically interoperate atop a platform. So each of these platforms, the Java Virtual Machine, the .NET platform, for example, is a variety of languages that can work together. And fairly seamlessly, I can have a Scala program that calls Java libraries and, uh, and vice versa. A lot of strength there. Turns out that here in the modeling space, we also have a lot of opportunities here. And the opportunities are reflective of the fact that these methodologies that we use are highly complementary. And it's not so much that one is the natural language to describe all things. Um, no one offers a fully adequate replacement for the others. There's a, there's a um, principle associated with complex, uh, complexity theory and encoding of systems, which says that you know, no one language is going to be able to be the, the quickest description for all programs. For all problems, some problems going to be amenable to one type of language, another to another, to a different sort of language, and so it is with system science methodologies. Um, there be certain problems that one of these would be more appropriate to, and some problems for another. But even within one problem, there may be certain sub areas of it that are amenable to to one language and some to another, and there are real synergies from combinations of these methodologies. Um, so why would you engage in hybrid modeling? Why mix these things together? Well, one thing is that each of these, each of these languages has, has certain areas that it's easier to represent. A second thing is that um, uh, if you have uh, a larger model, if you have a larger system, there may be different questions you're asking about different areas of, of the system, different levels of data available, different levels of detail that you want to represent. So in one area of the system, you want to represent individual people and track their histories. And that's not what you're going to do with an aggregate system dynamics model. It gives you system dynamics depiction here. If we have an aggregate, an aggregate model of a system, let's think about our SIR, SIRS system. And we have people going back here. Um, it's not very feasible. We talked about this briefly at one point. What we can get. <coughs> Well, we can get the number of people in any of these stops at the same time. It's not very feasible to ask how many people go through here 10 times, for example, at least 10 times over the course of the simulation. We can't ask about histories. The current situation counts the number of people in the stock, but we can't really ask 
how many of those same people were the people who were there a year ago. It's more or less interchangeable people in that stock. And short of duplicating this model many times, we're not going to be able to track individual trajectories. So sometimes we need to track things at an individual level, sometimes not. Very importantly, and I'll come back to this, as modeling deepens, modeling is about learning. I argued from the very first day of this class that models provide us a way to learn more quickly, more deeply, and more robustly from evidence that's available. By, by running a model, we translate a theory out of our head into the model, and we can test how does that theory jive or not with empirical evidence. We can test the degree to which it, it's consistent with the state of observation of the world, and we can deepen that model much more easily than we could if it were trapped in our head. And one of the things that comes about this is as you perform modeling, as you perform sensitivity analysis, et cetera, with the model, you learn what it's sensitive to, what things seem to matter the most. You're, in short, your sense of priorities change at, due to learning. And by representing things within the same model and different, having the capacity to change how you model different areas of your system, you can basically do something like turn an SD component of your model into an ABM. You could take something that's represented in a rough and ready way and deepen it. Or you can go the reverse way and, and aggregate it up because you realize it's not as central. Or you can represent resource dependencies where they weren't previously present in an ABM by switching to a DES or a, a representation. Sometimes different people understand these modeling methodologies differently. So there are some people who really understand and, and find a, a system dynamics depiction of a situation very familiar. Demographers are like that. They think in categories and kind of the number of people within a certain age and sex category and what have you, as might be depicted in a high-level system dynamics model. The number of people who are susceptible or what have you. Um, by contrast, people who spend their life dealing with individuals, like physicians, often have a very hard time grasping at an intuitive level what, what a system dynamics representation means compared to an uh, individual level formulation such as in an ABM or in a discrete event model. So stakeholders, they, they resonate with different types of modeling. And so if you're showing a certain portion of the model to them, sometimes it can be an advantage to phrase it in one way or the other. Second to last, um, these things have different computational efficiency. So, we talked about it earlier, but just as a refresh, as the population size of your model rises, which of these techniques, if we think about system dynamics being aggregate, if, if we use it in aggregate fashion, as we'll see, that's not always the case, and, and uh, we think about individual-based modeling in the form of agent-based and discrete event simulation, as the size of our population rises, Suppose we double the size of our population. How does that affect each of these techniques? How does, how does it affect an aggregate model, a system dynamics model? It doesn't. It's just bigger numbers in the model, right? The number associated with these stocks is twice as large. So basically, it doesn't affect the computation time at all. How does it affect it here? Right. Yeah. And potentially, yeah, it multiplies. If we double the population size, it goes up by at least a factor of two may go up by more because of certain network effects, or it may go up more because now it's too much to store in memory and so it starts thrashing or what have you. Um, uh, memory hierarchy effects um, from a computer science standpoint. But it has a big impact. Heterogeneity, if we want to represent the breakdown of the population by characteristic, how does that affect, uh, for example, uh, system dynamics model? So we suppose we want to break down the model so we have um, we divide people up by, by age or age category. It's difficult. It affects, affects the entire model or large portions of it, all the things, all the stocks, all the flows. How does it affect the running time of an ABM to add in age as a parameter for a person? In a very minor way, yeah, it's, 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 it's almost in the noise. It's extremely small. So ladies and gentlemen, um, these, these exhibit 
very different levels of computational efficiency. And often, for starting models, SD is going to be an aggregate SD approach is going to be a lot quicker than than the other two. Um, and finally, there's yes. Um, So in discrete event systems, it's a great question. So I think you're, you're asking about this, this one here. Yeah, so with discrete event systems, um, discrete event simulation, you're also characterizing at an individual level, okay? And we didn't spend time looking at it, but it turns out that, that um, in discrete event simulation, the when you have patients flowing through the system or cars flowing through a system, you can add in detailed characteristics of those entities very freely, and it doesn't actually impact the running time of this in a big way. It's just another parameter for a person and who's the entity flowing through. So it's much more similar to agent-based modeling than it is to SD. In terms of population size, for discrete event simulation. There, the running time will rise very significantly just with ABM, just as with ABM, okay? Um, it turns out that double, you know, doubling the population size will typically double the, the running time associated with a, um, a discrete event simulation because you're tracing the evolution through this workflow of each individual car, or individual person, or individual animal, or whatever it is, um, individual piece of, of paperwork. You're, you're tracing it through the system, and so you're putting it into this queue. You're, you're, um, you're testing whether or not it's been waiting too long, or what have you. So it, 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 it actually is much more similar to ABM, and it reflects the fact that both are individual-based models, okay? Um, the, the, the claim is that agent-based modeling was actually named to agent-based modeling um, only, only sort of a little bit after it was created because the, the original creators of it at, at Los Alamos National Lab, well, among the earliest creators of it, um, originally called it IBM, individual-based modeling. Um, but they didn't like the fact that this was a corporate name they thought it would be confused with the company. And they thought, man, I don't want like IBM getting its greasy hands on, on these models and claiming them a bit. So they said, well, let's think of a better name for, or let's think of an alternative name that won't carry this connotation. This is like in the 70s, 80s, when IBM was a big behemoth, uh, even more so than today, and was, it was engaged in a lot of shoddy business practices, actually, a lot of smoke and mirrors stuff. And so they ended up with ABM, agent-based models. But you'll still hear people refer to it as IBM uh, for individual-based models. And really, that, to a certain degree, that covers DES and, and agent-based modeling. Okay, so I'd like to talk about five patterns that are fairly compelling in the, um, in the hybrid modeling space. Okay, um, these five patterns uh, are Patterns in the same sense we talk about patterns of software. They're, they're kind of configurations that are not building blocks by themselves. They're not in the AnyLogic palette or what have you. But you see them again and again and again because they deliver real value. They, they're kind of higher level abstractions that deliver a lot, of, a lot of interesting value. And not surprisingly, many of these are represented in those models that I've just posted. So if you go to the Moodle site and you go and you download things, there are five models here, okay? Um, and I'd like to open up this first one first, which uh, in a fitting way is going to relate to this guy. So it's a multi-clinic SIR one, okay? And what I will do here is, uh, as we are speaking, I will go call up, okay, so any logic closed, I had it up earlier this afternoon. I'm going to call up my AnyLogic here, okay? 
and we're going to open up that model. That model is going to be associated with this notion of having a population, and the population is represented as an agent-based model, and then you have service delivery processes. So a service delivery process might provide you know, services for veterans and there's some workflow associated with it, or it may be a, uh, a system for, for receiving orders from that population um, for products, or it might be a, um, a health facility that serves uh, patients. Um, it could be any number of sort of service delivery mechanisms. And we're going to take a look at how we can use those two together to combine um, those two types of modeling, okay? Now, my AnyLogic is coming up, but if you open yours up, you should, uh, you should see that, uh, uh, the basic mechanisms of it. So basically what we're gonna have here is a population on the one hand, um, uh, and there's going to be particular service delivery locations um, uh, mixed in with the population. In this case, there are clinics. Okay, there, there are clinics mixed in with the population, which is located um, uh, located uh, in different uh, geographic areas. Um, maybe what I will do, just to add spice to this, is so you can see two examples of this. Um, I will show you a model that was demonstrating up in Prince Albert, um, and uh, I'll call this up. Um, okay, it looks like uh, I have closed it here, but I'll go go call it up. And uh, this model is a um, model that uh, is characterizing uh, things geographically. So it's not just uh, it's not just um, in a sort of abstract space, but a geographic space, okay? Um, so it's this one here, and uh, I'm gonna open it up. Um, I'll also open up the model you have so we can sort of go back and forth between them. Um, uh, here, we're going to have individuals, and they're going to present for care. They're gonna come for care to a facility, to a service facility, and then, at the service facility, they will be interacting with service delivery, and they'll be treated. They will be either delivered successful treatment or not, and that will affect their health state, and that will put them back into the population. And what goes on in the will be a function of that health state. So, for example, uh, the degree to which they they spread an infectious disease. Okay, so we're going to see that model, and I will open up the model that, that you have as well. So there's, uh, there's the city of Prince Albert, and here I'm going to open up um, the model that you have so we can start with that one. Here we are, multi-clinic hybrid. So here we're gonna have clinics. Now, what sort of modeling would you use to plausibly represent a clinic? Anyone? There it is, DES. So we have a resource limited flow of individuals, right? Um, meanwhile, we have agent-based modeling designed to capture the health evolution and people's care-seeking behavior. So what state they're in health-wise and when they seek care, okay? Um, the key here is going to be at two places. Number one, when they seek care, how do they go to care? So if we go here, this not seeking care in person, and we look at this transition, transition to, uh, to care. So they have a certain chance of going to care as long as they are in an infective and symptomatic state. So if their health state is such that they're in this state, that they're in ill health, they will go and seek care at a, at a clinic with a rate of about, of a hazard rate of 0.75 per day, okay? So on average, somewhere around 1.5 days uh, on average, uh, they're going to be going in for care, okay? Um, and when they seek care, they find the nearest clinic, 
by finding the nearest agent from the set of all clinics. And then they're going to go to that clinic, to that clinic's location, okay, to X and Y location. Now, so what you'll see is their health state motivates going there. Now the key is gonna be when they arrive at the clinic, they are injected into the clinic. They, they are taken into the clinic. There's this nearest clinic dot walk in, take, take me in. So this is this at this arriving to care. This is what actually injects them into the clinic. Let's go take a look at that. Walk in here, we'll go see. Walk in is exactly this place here. So they are placed into that clinic at this juncture. They're actually placing themselves into this clinic. And as a result of that, they're gonna flow through the clinic. So they're gonna be in this state and they can move around states, but in the meantime, they're gonna be in this clinic and they're gonna be in, any, in one of these locations in the clinic. Um, and their movement through the clinic will depend on availability of healthcare workers. Now, the other key junction is down here. Ladies and gentlemen, here we have a representation of an uncertainty, whether or not this person is treated successfully, okay? With, fifth, with a certain probability, probability of treatment success, they are sent a message saying that they are cured. If the treatment was unsuccessful, they, they simply flow out of this and they're not sent a message. Where do you think that message would be handled within this diagram? So we're sending that person who's flowing through here a message. Let, let's, let's be clear on that so we can see it clearly. We're sending this person, uh, so this, this thing is sending the agent a message. The agent is the entity flowing through. So they're sending him a message. Where do you think that ends up? Where does that message go? Yeah, exactly. So when this message cured is received, they flow back, okay? They flow back. Um, so you'll notice that the clinic, importantly, is mediated by availability of healthcare workers. Um, as one colleague widely observed, if it weren't, it would be as if you go to the clinic and you walk through a, a healing beam and you're you're, you're healed by the beam and you leave. Um, that would be a situation if it weren't you know, resource constrained, but most clinics are resource constrained. You have to wait for someone there. You're not simply walking through the heal beam. Um, maybe in your lifetime, not in mine, okay? Um, so, um, so here we need the availability of resource, and so we have a certain pool of resources and we've seen this before, DES. I don't have to explain to you all of DES, but we have a certain number of healthcare workers here that are, are dictated by a parameter, right? So, so, what hap so that message is sent to them, and that, that leads to their state from the agent side being evolved. So we have a, a cycle here, right? We have agents going in and joining a workflow in the discrete event modeling side, and then we have the discrete event modeling side Sending a, sending a message which ends up affecting the agent-based modeling side, um, the, the agent's health state, okay? Um, and that ends up in turn affecting their likelihood of, of seeking care. It's only if they are infective that they are gonna seek care. So now we have this kind of um, interaction between a discrete event model in the clinics and the individual persons in the population, neither is a solitude. They are in fact interacting over time. And what you see is actually, a, it's greater than the sum of the parts in the sense that you'll see behavior which is, is very different. And we don't have time to go into this, but um, you, can, you can go and, and look at uh, the explanation. And what you'll find is there are tipping points. There are situations where if you provide just enough clinics, the outbreak never really starts. If you provide too few clinics, you get a very serious uh, situation where the outbreak, um, the outbreak will start to uh, to get established, and it's and it's harder to to you know uh, snuff it out at that point. Okay, um, 
So here we have uh, lock in effects illustrated. And those lock in effects actually um, involve both the individuals and these clinics. So if we go here and we look at the clinics, we'll find you know this is a clinic which is getting very high rates of traffic. You have healthcare workers basically constantly working, but most people are actually balking. It's actually comparatively few people that that um, that flow through here. If we add healthcare workers in, here I'm adding healthcare workers in, and now we're getting treating successfully most people, most people in the clinic, and as a result, we've drained the swamp. We're no longer having this issue of a of a very um, very persistent infection. The deal is that it takes a lot more healthcare workers. It can take, in some cases, a lot more healthcare workers to snuff it out later than it would have to prevent it from getting established. We saw a system dynamics variant of this before, right? Okay. So here we have interacting service delivery represented via the clinic, and we have individual persons. So this service delivery process here is a healthcare process, but it could just as easily be a workflow process for applying for insurance or a process for applying for veterans benefits or a process um, for applying for ID accounts or what have you. And we have this interaction between a broader population at an agent level and this, um, this particular service delivery mechanism. So on the service delivery side, this language of discrete event modeling is exquisitely expressive. It allows you to characterize in a crisp way these service delivery processes. We can use that for part of the model. And over here, we can use the language of agent-based modeling uh, as captured over here in the agent palette to kind of characterize the evolution of particular agents. Very powerful combination, quite compelling. And you see quite a few models uh, that, that can combine these things in, in fruitful ways. So that's compelling pattern one. Any questions or comments on that? Questions or comments? So again, those two key points there. OK. Um, maybe we could get that other door over there. Um, so the uh, well, we, uh, we don't have to, as compelling as these are, they may not be compelling for those working on projects over in the, the, the lab there. OK, so these few key points, number one, the, the discrete event simulation can affect the agents, say, through messages. The people can be injected into the discrete event simulation. And, and uh, those two provide sort of the key linkages between these two. OK, so I'd like to close this model, as, as fun as it is to, uh, to talk about it. And maybe in the interest of time, I'll simply note that a similar model it's very easy to build in a geographically specific context. So um, I don't know if we'll have time to cover it next week. Uh, I would very much like to, but I have my doubts as to whether we'll be able to get to it. But any logic provides over here in the palette, if you go down to the, to the uh, space markup area, the capacity to undertake what's called GIS modeling. Does anyone know what GIS stands for here? Yeah, geographic information systems. So ladies and gentlemen, there's been a revolution of the past few decades um, in the ability to access geographic specific information related to areas. And, and these days, as there has been for a while, but it's especially um, a big interest now, there's a lot of um, interest in how we support geographic querying how we support information to be available about specific geographies, and whether it comes down to delivering geographic-specific services or geographic-specific advertising or geographic-specific um, information awareness um, uh, or finding about resources, geographic information systems provide a huge opportunity for giving insight in the information we receive from the world or providing services to people. So this is a depiction of, of the GIS map component of, of, of any logic. And online, you'll find me giving lectures on, on how to build models like this. Um, but fundamentally, we can place agents within geographic space. 
and we can place resources such as clinics within geographic space. And we can have individuals routed in geographic space from place to place um, in a way that, uh, that is in accordance with the geography. Um, so, you know, if we were to go um, run this model here, um, I haven't shared this with you, um, but here we go. Um, what you'll find is we can scatter individuals, for example, around Prince Albert, connect them up to each other in networks here, and we can keep track of their health status using visual indications. And we can also have these individuals move. And if they do move, they will tend to go across um, sensible sort of lines where they'll cross the river at the bridge. They'll be routed on street grids or routed on bike paths or routed according to, um, uh, according to uh, walking paths. Um, uh, this sort of modeling is uh, a growing interest for certain types of problems, particularly when we want to uh, ask about how the placement of a resource in space affects the evolution of, of, of people in that area, for example. Um, also, if we're interested in how um, different availability of resources in different regions affects things, um, uh, this sort of modeling is useful. If we want to have people's decision making, like which route they take, depends on their current geographic location, and those, those uh, decisions end up affecting traffic jams, et cetera. Models like this are extremely important. Uh, and this sort of model uh, can be run very readily within any logic and used, um, used to sort of explore uh, geography. So I'll, I'll put up one more model like this just so you could see this. Um, there's a food, and in this case PA is not Prince Albert, but uh, physical activity. Um, I'll just put this up uh, on the site so you can get access to it here. Okay, here we go. Um, in case any of you want to run it um, during the uh, lecture here. Okay, so here we go. And this is, ah, we'll do the Saskatchewan uh, food geographic environment. Um, I think that's for Saskatoon, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll do, um, there's a food PA environment um, that, that I also have here. Okay, where is it? Um, uh, here it is, GIS food and PA environment. In case anyone is interested in geographic, um, geographic models, this will give you a good starting point. Okay. Um, so those models uh, combine together a representation of service delivery um, uh, in a particular context for that model I just showed for PA, um, but other models don't involve that, but are just integrate the GIS components. Okay, so um, that's the, the example GIS and the final one I'll, I'll modify here as well so you can download it easily. Um, there we go, and make it so it's forced download. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, you'll find that those models uh, require network connections so they can draw information in. Next, I'd like to look at this model that's called, that's available for download. It's called budding. ABM hybrid model. Um, uh, so uh, this is, is one of the models. We don't have time to go into it. Okay, so here we go. And this one will be uh, here, and it's in hybrid models, and it's called budding hybrid SD ABM model. And in this case, what we have is a situation where we have system dynamics and agent-based modeling rather than, than agent-based modeling um, and discrete event modeling living in two different areas, we have system dynamics and agent-based modeling living next to each other, so to speak, at the same level of aggregation. So here we have a system dynamics model and a mean time to develop diabetes. But what happens is if a person reaches a certain place in the model, um, they'll be created as an agent. And the idea here is that sometimes we're interested in a subset of a population. Maybe we're interested in older cars, or maybe we're interested in, um, in individuals who have a certain condition. We don't want to ignore the whole population, so we represent it in a rough way with system dynamics, aggregate modeling. But once they reach a certain point, we create them 
as an agent. So here we have agents. These, these are individuals. Um, and in this case, it's not a particularly compelling representation. But the key point here is that once they reach a certain point, they start as a number in a stock. And once they reach that point, they're created as an agent. And then they become individuated. They turn into one agent. Okay, They're created as an agent. And basically, this stock here just keeps track of number of diabetics to be created as agents. And once that stock reaches a certain value, so I'm going to go over to main here just to see this. Once that stock reaches a certain value, a value of at least one, it's going to trigger this event. So this event is a conditionally triggered event. It's based on the stock. And once it reaches one or more, it gets triggered. And here, basically, we figure out the count of agents to be created, which is just the integer number of agents that are there. We add them to the population, and we deduct them from the stock. And then we reset the event to fire again the next time it grows greater than 1. So this is a way of creating agents from a system dynamics, aggregate system dynamics model when they flow into a certain place they're agentized, okay? They go from being a number without a history to being a full individual who can then be tracked for a sustained time. And in some models like this, they actually flow back to being numbers and stocks after a certain period of time, okay? So we've looked at that. So this is a model of system dynamics and agent-based where system dynamics is used to characterize most of the population and then a subset of the population we characterize as agents. And we do so by creating them as soon as they would be in a certain stock. We turn them into an agent. Questions about that? OK. OK, now let's talk about system dynamics driven agent evolution. This is one of the more thought provoking ones, I think. So in this, uh, there's a model. And it's called CTL state variable. Use any logic 7. Do you see that? Yeah, if you could go download that one. Here, we are going to have individuals which will, whose evolution will be described in part using traditional agent-based mechanisms, state charts. But part of it will be described using, oh, is it, is it, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Here it is, um, there it is. Um, uh, part of it will be described using stocks and flows. So here's a person, and there's their state chart. They have a, they have a quite, quite uh, abbreviated state chart. Um, but over here to the right, they have their evolution dictated according to stocks and flows. Okay. What you actually see here is a depiction drawn from a book by... Um, prominent and esteemed authors, uh, Nowak and, and Robert May, Sir Robert May in the UK, who's a, um, uh, a modeler of, of, of great, um, uh, great esteem um, uh, within the UK context. Uh, and they were characterizing using stocks and flows, in other words, differential equations, the evolution of the immune aspects of the immune system. Uh, X here is uninfected cells, Y is infected cells. Um, so the idea here is, this is in the context of viral dynamics. So virus comes into the body, um, excuse me, virus comes into the body from neighbors, neighboring individuals from outside. It, it comes in, the virus then multiplies, um, uh, it multiplies due to the presence of infected cells. But the presence of the virus leads to cells getting infected, OK? And you can think of it as kind of a little outbreak within the body. This, this happens. If any of you are sick right now, there's a decent chance this is happening within you right now. Um, so cells are getting infected. The cells undergo lysis or, or otherwise release free virions. That produces more virus particles. And what happens with the immune system with some of the viral infections um, is that 
viral production starts perhaps very small from outside. You just get a little bit from that person who's coughed next to you or what have you. And then it starts to infect cells very quickly. Cells are infected, um, uh, release free variants, virus builds up more, multiplies, and it spreads in a, in a growing way within the esophagus, within areas of the, of the, of the body, um, particularly the airways. And that leads to greater and greater levels of viral load. And that makes you feel really lousy, as does the infection of, of cells here. But what also happens is that these, this spread within the body trick, uh, kicks off uh, a set of responses within the body. And it's, a, it's an amazingly intricate and beautiful system, um, the immune system within the body. And it has several different arms to it, cell-mediated immunity, innate immunity. Um, this is depicting cell-mediated immunity. Um, and what you see here is a certain number of cells represented in, in sort of a, an abstract way, but these represent like CTLs, uh, the, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And these, these end up basically killing off these cells, these, these infected cells. They're killed off by these CTLs. And the immune system, meanwhile, is multiplying, building that strength to fight the infection by multiplying here. And that's a C parameter. So it kind of builds up its own forces to fight, fight off the, um, the infected cells. And if one's immune system is strong enough and C is large enough, your body will respond before the viral load that kills you. But if you've got a really weak immune system, you have, you have uh, a really nasty virulent um, uh, virus within your body. Um, uh, if your immune system has been compromised by diseases, you're an immunosuppressant drugs or what have you, it may not be able to respond quick enough in a viral infection that, that could be defeated by yourself and, and um, with a stronger immune system can overcome you. That's what happens with West Nile virus with birds, for example, they get very high levels of uremia and they'll die. And this happens with older people with flu. It's a sad thing to know. But the flu that you folks brush off each year, it's unpleasant. It knocks us down for a week or two, makes us feel lousy, perhaps for even longer. But we, we, we overcome it, that can kill a person. And that can kill a person in large part because this response isn't fast enough. So this is a feedback system, ladies and gentlemen, based on accumulation. See, if the immune system accumulates, number of infected cells accumulate, the virus accumulates, and there's feedbacks involving it. Feedbacks involving viral production, feedbacks involving the immune system killing off infected cells, involving multiplication of the immune system. And it's a natural fit for depiction with system dynamics in an agent-based, in, in, in an aggregate fashion. Rather than representing each immune system cell, which is possible and has been the focus of some work, we characterize things at a high level here. So we have these dynamics characterized within a person, these feedback dynamics using system dynamics. It's a very elegant depiction, and it's not a solitude from the agent-based components. Indeed, this variance from neighbors is coming in from, based on the total viral load of neighbors, and if we go to the total viral load of neighbors, you can go here and right click and, and uh, hold down the control key while clicking on it, you will find that we loop over all neighbors in the network. And as long as there are a neighbor, we basically total up the viral load of them and return them. Man, I've got to redo that in Java 8. Um, that'd be so elegant, man. Um, uh, okay. Um, okay, so let's go up here. High viral viral fatal load. Oh, I guess I should show you one other thing. Um, here, within a person, uh, this is an older version of any logic. This was built in, and so I gotta update that. Um, here's a small oval up here in the upper left. And if you go look, the fill color is set by this thing called people color, okay? And people color ends up being affected by the level of, of free variance here, okay? Um, uh, moreover, the size, the radius of this, of this oval is set by Z, and Z, ladies and gentlemen, is associated with immune system activity. So it's going to be colored more and more red as viral load goes up, and it's going to be covered, it's going to be grow as the level of uh, immune system activation as goes up. So let's go take, uh, take a look at it. Here we go. There's uh, 
we'll, we'll go take a look how this operates with the high vi uh, viral load, okay? So here we go. We're going to start with an infection over here. I'm right-clicking and dragging here. Um, we're going to start with an infection there, okay? Um, so here we have a depiction of viral dynamics. So what's going on here? Um, we have a high level of, of viral load, hence it's very red, but the immune system is responding. And notice that as it responds, it, it, it grows slower and slower. And then at some point, the viral load drops dramatically. The immune system has it in check. But before the, viral, before the immune system can respond fully, the virus has grown to a pretty high level. It's only now that the immune system is able to snuff it out. Okay? Um, so this is a depiction of the dynamics within a person associated with viral load and immune system response, where each person is evolving according to stocks and flows. Okay? Um, uh, and we can take a look at, at uh, a accumulation, for example, of population-wide viral load, of uh, the virus load averaged across the, the, um, the whole population, for example. And what we'll find is it tends to go in, in kind of uh, uh, in bursts associated with waves of sort of viral load. But at some point, the, um, the infection is brought under control, and, and it's only, um, only operating at sort of small levels of, of uh, slight, uh, uh, slight sort of variation. Um, any one of these individuals we could click on, uh, we can go drag down to, go to people, and we can go here and check out, for example, their viral load, and we will find that it, it's still oscillating some. They're getting better, better under control, but it's, it's reached levels that are, are more fundamentally under control. Okay. Um, next, we are going to go look at the case of individuals who are subject with, with weak, with, uh, Immune systems, we could think of them as, as weaker. It's this low viral load, low fatal viral load threshold. Okay, Here, what we're going to have is a situation where people's virus, once it reaches a certain level, uh, it can easily kill them. Okay, um, And we will see a situation where people with high levels of virus who could transmit it end up getting removed. Um, and as a result, they, um, uh, they're not spreading it to an as pronounced a way to other people. So here, we have a situation where people die if their viral load threshold, if their virus goes above a certain viral load threshold. Um, why would you build a model like this? Well, one of the big motivations is, ladies and gentlemen, a weak immune system can affect many things. It can affect how long your virus stays at level high enough to be transmitted. It can affect your likelihood of dying, for example. It can affect um, the, the, the level of virus your reaches within your body. And you can quantify how those things depend as a function of the immune system. But what's much more natural here is to describe it as an emergent feature of the system where we track the viral dynamics over time within a person in a way that all those things are emergent properties. How long does it stay in someone who has a weaker viral, a weaker immune system, a lower value of C? Well, um, uh, we, we could measure it out as an emergent feature of this, how long it stays above a certain level. Um, uh, how high a level does it reach? We can track that as well. These are emergent features of this. So anyway, um, here, we are using system dynamics to characterize feedback-based accumulation systems within a person, and we're using stocks and flows to capture other features that are more naturally discrete, whether someone is living or dead, for example. Um, this is a very elegant combination. Could we characterize this with agent-based modeling alone without stocks and flows? You bet. We could it would be a lot more ugly. I'd be writing a lot of code, essentially longhand, that 
that numerically integrates, does numerical integration. It's just much more natural to phrase it as a system like this, to phrase it in a way that, that characterizes the dynamics with stocks and flows um, explicitly. It's just much more, much more elegant, much more draws my attention to the essential details rather than to the software engineering craft needed to write this from scratch. So this is agent-based evolution. Um, driven by system dynamics and together with traditional mechanisms for agent-based living alongside the agent-based formulation. I had a question from someone in this class recently. They saw me undertake an action that I think surprised them. I went and I put into Maine a state chart. Can state charts live in Maine? No reason not. You gotta have a state chart that represents the current season, for example, right? Spring, summer, fall, autumn. Um, spring, summer, fall, winter. <laughs> How did I forget? Um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, don't don't be caught up in the fact that um, that you know things can only live in one place. That system dynamics can only live in Maine. The state charts can only live in person. That events are only in a, in Maine. No, these things can be mixed and matched. It's the advantage of a good language. You can you can use things in very flexible, creative ways. Okay, let's take a look at this now. Um, okay, for this one, um, uh, what is the best uh, model of those that I have uploaded here? Um, so. Well, um, actually, the one we just had open is not a bad, bad start. So if we go to Maine, um, we can go in Maine to, um, I'm trying to locate where it is here. It wasn't immediately obvious, but here we go. System dynamics, it's, it's over in this region, and let's, let's go find out where that is here. In, in a, any logic, you can mark certain areas. Ah, it's just down, down from the top there, okay? Um, you can mark certain regions using this so-called view, um, this sort of mechanism. And this allows you to navigate these view areas, allows you to sort of navigate to different areas within a model quickly, okay? Um, so here, what we're doing is we have this total population um, and we have a, we have an accumulated here mean vi variance across population. So this, this stock is accumulating across the entire population, the viral load over time. Remember, stocks are accumulations, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a flow into the stock, the value of the stock now is the integral of the value of that flow, the sum up of the value of the flow um, you know, over small little bits of time, uh, over over the um, uh, over the the past time till now. So this stock summarizes things across the entire model. Um, we could have a model, for example, where we have a stock that represents the cumulative costs that have been borne across the entire model, and it will be totaling up the costs all through the model. Maybe you're totaling up costs associated with a promotion campaign for a new product, or maybe it's costs associated with a immunization campaign. You could have, a, you could have uh, this stock up here, and it's accumulating things that are drawn from agents. So this new population-wide viral load, it's computing mean variance across population, and that is going over all, pop, all agents in the population and just totaling up the number of, of variants across them and, and returning that by the number of people. So ladies and gentlemen, we can have models that the overall dynamics are driven by, by uh, the overall dynamics are driven by agents, but that dynamics at an overall level is characterized with, uh, with aggregate system dynamics, okay? Um, so um, quite straightforward. There's more compelling yet patterns uh, of this sort, um, but I think I'll, I'll leave that one um, to that th because I want to get on to this final one. 
aggregate system dynamics describes uh, agent population uh, evolution. So here we're going to have system dynamics at an aggregate level, um, and it's going to describe the, pay, the, uh, the evolution of the uh, individuals. So for, to see that, I'd like you to go to environmental contamination hybrid. Okay. I should note gridded hybrid model is, is a lot of fun. Um, uh, we may come back to that if we have time, but it's environmental contamination hybrid that um, I'd like you to look at. So I'm going to open it here. It's under hybrid models. Here we are, environmental contamination hybrid. What this is, um, this model was built in this room um, uh, not, uh, not too long ago. Um, so we have a, a space that's a geographic space, although it's described abstractly here. Um, and it's contained homes, populations, and workplaces. And each person within this place is going to be subject to infection, but they're also subject to a schedule. They have off time and work time. And they're at a certain time of day, they're going to go to work. And when they go to work, this is in person, they're going to move to their workplace. So each person is associated with a home and a workplace. So when it comes time to work, they're going to move to their workplace. Here we go. And when it's time for their work to be over, they will go home. Okay. Move to, you're familiar with it uh, from your problem sets and from classwork. So I won't go into that. It's going to move them. But meanwhile, they're subject to this infection. And this infection can occur in one of two ways. Um, one is for the initial person, we can infect them with a message. But otherwise, it occurs through the environment and they have a certain hazard rate based on their exposure level. And their exposure level is going to be based on reservoirs of contamination, surfaces that are covered by bugs um, uh, that, they can, that they can catch. Okay? Um, so this current exposure level, we can go and click on that if you want to. Um, and what you'll find is if, if they're at a workplace, it's based on the pathogen reservoir at the workplace. Otherwise, it's based on the pathogen reservoir at home. So this brings to mind, what are these pathogen reservoirs in the home and the workplace? Let's go click on them. So go to home. Home is where you hang your hat, but it's also the place where the pathogen builds up in this model. So um, here we have a pathogen reservoir. And we have two competing processes. On the one hand, we have pathogen inactivation, whereby pathogen decays with a mean pathogen lifetime. In addition, we have a we have a, some shedding of pathogen which goes on, meaning pathogen can be placed down there. And here, it's based on a per capita shedding rate and the count of infectives that are currently around, okay? And that here we're getting the number of people who are currently at this location, and we're asking how many of them are infective, and using that to define the shedding rate. So per capita shedding rate, basically if people around are infective, it builds up the pathogen, and then anyone can get it. Anyone from the area can get infected by the pathogen via this link here. Okay, it, it asks, okay, what, what level of contamination is around me? What's my exposure level? And that will affect their, their likelihood of getting sick of a susceptible person. Okay, so let's run this thing. Um, let's, let's run her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it with a medium population here. Okay, and I'm getting close to the end of class here. Okay, um, here we go. So here we have people at homes, and the, I think the size of the home is based on the number of people there. And then we have workplaces. And you'll notice that each of these is labeled with a rectangle, which indicates the amount of pathogen there. So we're going to run this thing. And what you'll find is that people go to work. You know, it's off to work we go. And 
Now they're at work. Now, unbeknownst to these people, one of these people is infected. And now you see three people from the same household are infected. Notice the color associated with this household. The pathogen reservoir is building up in that household. And by virtue of that, anyone who's uninfected in that household can spread it to others. So they come back and they go to their workplaces. And now this workplace has started to build up some pathogen. And now those people are gonna go back to their homes. You could see them spread out like a vector. And, and they're going to their homes. And now in the homes, there's gonna be pathogen shed as well. So this home is building it up, this home. You could see the, the telltale pink indicating the buildup of pathogen. Now they're going back and you're starting to see a larger and larger fraction of this population infected. And if you scroll up, you can actually see a representation of the amount of pathogens at the home or at workplaces. You can see workplaces are still the highest, reflecting many people working there. So here, you're having agent evolution being affected by system dynamics for that area. There's pathogen around them at their workplace, pathogen around them at their, at their home. And I won't go into it, um, but, uh, but you know, it, this is gonna continue until people start to recover. And at some point, the amount of pathogen present will peak and, and then it will start to decay because people are recovering. They're not shedding as much. And in fact, you, can, you might be able to see here the first little bit, uh, it's, it's on the rise again. Anyway, um, so here's the final pattern um, where we have, uh, we have uh, ag uh, system dynamics used within aspects of the environment to accumulate. We also have some aggregate system dynamics cumulative infection hours across the population, which is basically totaling up the number of people here. This is an aggregate stock and flow, um, but again, playing to the strength of aggregate modeling. It's totaling up the number of people infected over time using a stock. And if you do that here, this is just the population that are shedding right now the number of people who are shedding. And because the model time, time units is hours, if this is one person over 10 hours of shedding, no one before, no one after, it'll accumulate 10, 10 infection hours. If it's 10 people over 10 hours, it'd be 100 people, 100 infection hours. If it's 100 people over one hour, that this flow is one and before and after it's zero, excuse me, the flow is 100, 100 people for one hour, then it will be 100 as well. Okay, so this is totaling up across the whole population. That's more akin to this agents drive aggregate system dynamics. We're counting things up and we're accumulating them. System dynamics, very convenient way of describing feedback, risk, accumulation processes, agent-based modeling very effective for describing interactions of agents in an environment with each other, with the environment. CES to represent resource constrained flow and defined workflows. Five hybrid modeling patterns of significance. The more significant thing yet is that we can mix these and match these in a single model. And as we learn about what's needed, Perhaps we start originally with a very aggregate model with state charts of the immune system. And as we learn what's needed, we can expand it using a tool of our choice. We can mix in one language with the other in the same diagram. That's power. That's, that's power to be able to expressively describe a situation as we learn about it rather than having to switch modeling types altogether. Okay, so that's all for today. I'm going to be holding office hours uh, in my office once again, um, and uh, I'd be glad to answer questions about the uh, final uh, assignment if there were some. Okay? Thanks very much.